Uh, church, you can, uh, go ahead and open up your Bibles to Genesis chapter 21 today. And if you've been following along, we've been going through the gospel in Genesis, and the intention of this series has been to show you how implicitly and in certain places fairly obvious ways where the gospel message is pointed out through the Old Testament stories. And this one, this story in particular, is one of the most difficult stories in the entire, uh, I'd say, argue the entire Old Testament and in the entire Bible itself. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to go through this, but for the sake of time, we're going to be in Genesis chapter 21, and then we will only be through a, a section of that, and then jump into Genesis 22 as well. So if you have your Bibles, Genesis chapter 21 is where we are, and we're just going to go through this text and uh, just see what God has to offer for us in here. So verses 1 through 7 of chapter 21 say this. The Lord visited Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did to Sarah as he had promised. And Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age, at the time of which God had spoken to him. Abraham called the name of his son who was born to him, whom Sarah bore him, Isaac. And Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days old, as God had commanded him. Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born to him. And Sarah said, God has made laughter for me. Everyone who hears will laugh over me. And she said, Who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I have borne him a son in his old age. So if you've been following along in the story of Genesis, Abraham is one of the most important characters in the entire book itself. And Eric even mentioned before that out of the New Testament, Abraham is the second most mentioned name, uh, second most mentioned individual in the Old Testament that, that we find in the New Testament as well. And in this story, it focuses on the promise that has been made to Abraham. And that promise is explicit. It's the son. Abraham is a, a man who is in his old age, and he has no children. And we see in this, there's a, a huge burden on him where he will not have an heir. And this is something that was very important in the ancient Near Eastern culture at this time. But we see that the promise of Isaac over and over again mentioned. And here it actually focuses on Sarah. Sarah in particular here, and there's a few things we want to notice about Sarah, is that her joy is now fulfilled. This could be the end of the story right here. God had, had already promised. He, he promised that Isaac would be born, and here it is. Isaac is here. And just look at the joy that Sarah has right now. It says, The Lord did to Sarah as he had promised, and Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old, old age. She finally had joy. She finally had laughter. There was joy in Abraham's house. And to understand why she had such a sense of joy in this point, we have to understand the culture. And you don't really even have to understand the culture of the ancient Near East. You can just understand it in our own day and age. There is a high amount of sorrow, and in this age and culture, uh, shame involved with infertility. And Sarah had to deal with a, a heightened sense of this shame and this burden in her life. And it's almost self-evident. I don't really have to explain why this is, that she, she was burdened with this, but uh, we can talk about this theologically as well as biologically. But there is a great deal of pain in her life that she could not conceive a child. Theologically, let's look at it from this perspective. If you look at Genesis chapter 4, verses 20, uh, the woman is named, and she has a particular name called Eve, which means life giver. So we see that God is given to women, and he gives to men and women different uh, roles and responsibilities, but he also gives them different privileges. And one of the privileges of being a woman was that you get to experience the, the joy of giving life, uh, to create life and sustain the life of children. Now, this is obviously biological. We see that women have to carry a child for you know, nine months or so, and also after that, they continually feed the child for about two years up to their life. So this is a thing that God shares. This is an attribute of God that he shares with women in particular, that men do not get to partake in. God himself is the creator of all life. God himself is the life giver, and he allows women a, a part in this process as well. And we see in the fall, in actually Genesis 3.16, that there would be pain in childbearing, physical pain. But I would argue that infertility is actually a, a greater pain and can be a greater curse uh, than childbearing itself. And to stress this point, you guys have, may have heard this proverb. There's a, a poet, uh, Alfred Lord Tennyson, 
who wrote this poem. Uh, he wrote this poem after his friend died very unexpectedly in his early 20s. And he wrote this, and you, you may, have, may have heard this. He said, I hold it true, whatever befall, I feel it when I sorrow most. Tis better to have loved and lost than never to have loved at all. Uh, so these words ring fairly true to us. The pain of childlessness was a pain just as sorrowful and just as helpless as it is today. And Sarah experienced this pain longer than most. Remember, Sarah was in her 80s or 90s at this point by the time she finally conceived Isaac. Some of the questions that I'd like to pose today is, is why? Or maybe that's the question that's on your mind. Why did God make Abraham and Sarah wait for so long? The majority of their lives had already been spent, uh, particularly Sarah. About 75% of her life was already done and over with by the time she finally conceived and bore Isaac. So why? Isaac was the reward of this patience, this divine blessing, but why the wait? Why this long pain inflicted upon Sarah, this long shame? And it's actually helpful to look at the example of Zechariah and Elizabeth from the New Testament. They bore John the Baptist in, in the same way, this miracle that happened. They're in their old age beyond childbearing years, and John the Baptist is born to them. And it says explicitly in Luke 1.6 that both Zechariah and Elizabeth were righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. So it wasn't for sin that Elizabeth was barren. It wasn't for sin that Sarah had such a long time to wait until she had a child. So it's a theological mystery for two things. Why God waits to fulfill his promise, and the second thing is why does God allow for prolonged suffering? And for the sake of brevity, it's best to just assume two things, and we can go on with this. This could be a whole other sermon series, but two things that will help you with this. First thing to assume is that God gives you certain things at certain times because he's deemed it best. He's deemed it best for you. The second thing, the thing that I wanted to uh, push on a little bit, is that God uses prolonged suffering as a means to sanctify you. And actually, the Scottish minister and writer, George MacDonald, understood this point fairly well. And when he was reading Hebrews chapter 12, verse 29, he became fairly enamorated with this title for God. Hebrews 12, 29 says, for our God is a consuming fire. And so he was thinking about this idea of the fire. And what does the fire do? Well, a fire can provide warmth and comfort, but the fire also purifies. That's how you refine certain metals. You have to burn up the impurities in the metal to get what is imperishable. So George MacDonald viewed suffering in this way, that it's a means of sanctifying us. And so he does this by the flame. He does this through pain and this is why it can be terribly dangerous for Christians to assume that your suffering is nothing more than a bother on your life. Never, never assume that. And C.S. Lewis is actually largely influenced by MacDonald in, in many ways, but he actually stated in his book, The Problem of Pain, that God uses pain as a megaphone to rouse a deaf world. So we have to understand there is a purpose in, in pain and suffering. And uh, Tolstoy actually makes this, this point in his short story, and I'd recommend anyone to read it. It's called God Sees the Truth But Waits, or another way to translate it, God Sees the Truth But Waits to Tell It. And it's a very short story. You can read it without half an hour. But it's the story of Ivan Askolnikov. Uh, and it's this man who, he's a, a decent man. He has a wife and a young family. He was fairly uh, a bit of a, you know, he, he drank a little earlier on in his life, but he'd gotten cleaned up. He was a very successful merchant. He had a wife, children, uh, just a normal guy. And in this story, he goes on this trip to, with fellow merchants. He leaves his wife and family just for a short business trip in order to network and figure out uh, other means of selling his, his wares. And as he's going there, he sleeps in this kind of inn. And there's another individual, another man in the, with the wall next to him. And what happens is he leaves early in the morning, uh, nothing unusual, and then he's stopped by police. Police said there was a murder directly next to him. The only one who could have access to this man was him. So they searched his things. They found a bloody knife in his bag. And the man, Ivan, had no idea why that was in there. And so he's arrested and he's sent to prison. He spends his life in prison. And uh, at this point, it's his about 26 years. And eventually in this story, we see that Ivan's in there for a long time, and, and 
Eventually, he has a man, that, a new prisoner, comes in. And he's from his hometown. And he starts asking him questions and wondering about his family and all these things. And he quickly finds out that this man was the man who actually framed him. And he, he conceals this knowledge. Eventually, Ivan sees this man trying to tunnel out of the prison. And he catches him, and the man begs him that he will not turn him into the guards. And, and Ivan is tormented by this because he confronts him in the spot and says, you frame me. I've spent my life here because of you. And, and he said, I do not know what I'm going to do next. He eventually decides not to turn him in. And this, this is the point in the text. I'll actually just read it directly for you. So in this story, this is the, the quote between these two individuals having this dialogue after Ivan decides not to turn him over. He said, it's easy for you to talk, said Ivan, but I have suffered for you these 26 years. Where could I go now? My wife is dead and my children have forgotten me. I have nowhere to go. Makar did not rise, but beat his head on the floor. Ivan Dmitrich, forgive me, he cried. When they flogged me with the knot, it was not so hard to bear as it is to see you now. Yet you had pity on me and did not tell. For Christ's sake, forgive me, wretched that I am. And began to sob. When Ivan heard him sobbing, he too began to weep. God will forgive you, he said. Maybe I am a hundred times worse than you. And at these words, his heart grew quite light and longing for home left him. He no longer had any desire to leave the prison, but only hoped for his last hour to come. In spite of what Ivan had said, Makar confessed his guilt. But when the order for his release came, Ivan was already dead. So the point that Tolstoy is making, this is a fictional story, was that we have a very poor and misconstrued version of our own righteousness. And we have a very poor view of suffering in our lives. We don't realize that God might be doing something in us and through us, through our suffering for his glory and our good. So here we are in the story of Abraham. God had finally fulfilled his promise. Isaac was born. Joy was in the house of Abraham. Sarah had laughter on her lips. And then we see a turn. So Isaac's name actually means laughter. And this is going to be a common motif through the rest of, actually, Genesis and in particular story of Abraham. Because laughter, and we see this, it looks the same, but there's going to be moral implications between the two versions of laughter here. Sarah has this type of laughter that's joyful. Joyful in the fact that Isaac had been born, but now we're going to see Ishmael. He is going to laugh mockingly. So two actions that look the same, have great and different consequences. Verses 8 through 14 read this. And the child grew and was weaned, and Abraham made a great feast on the day that Isaac was weaned. But Sarah saw the son of Hagar the Egyptian, whom she had borne to Abraham, laughing. So she said to Abraham, Cast out this slave woman with her son, for the son of this slave woman shall not be heir with my son Isaac. And the thing was very displeasing to Abraham on account of his son. So Abraham loved Ishmael. But God said to Abraham, Do not, Be not displeased because of the boy and because of your slave woman. Whatever Sarah says to you, do as she tells you, for through Isaac shall your offspring be named. And I will make a nation of the son of, your, of the slave woman also, because he is your offspring. So Abraham rose early in the morning and took bread and a skin of water and gave it to Hagar, putting it on her shoulder, along with the child, and sent her away. And she departed and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. So the question is, why is this word laughter used so much? And, it, and just what I mentioned earlier, it displays a, a mystery. Two actions that look the same have different moral implications. And to push this point a little bit more, we can see this in our own day and age. Imagine two different men. They go and they find a stranger and they decide to give him, buy him a meal. Now, from the outside, this looks the same. They're both fulfilling the law of loving your neighbor, but they could be totally different. One could love this stranger as a brother, as an equal. The other could view him as an inferior. As someone who is homeless, we can view them as inferior to us. They're not on the same level that we are. One person could be making a sacrifice to provide a meal for this man. He's going to be hungry the rest of the day. The other person isn't going to make a sacrifice without complaining about it. One person will never mention the act to another soul, and maybe he's going to even forget that it happened himself. But the other person will continually remind everyone what he did. One will hold this memory with joy, the other with self-righteous uh, pleasure. So actions can be the same, but there's a completely different goal. 
And so Hagar and Ishmael are cast out by the harsh words of Sarah. And through this action, we actually see St. Paul forms an analogy between these two uh, stories and between these two individuals in Galatians 4, 21 to 31. So he says that the mothers and the sons here represent two different types of covenants. One is the covenant of the law and one is the covenant of grace. And Martin Luther actually explained this in his commentary on Galatians. He said, they were both the true sons of Abraham with this difference, that Ishmael was born after the flesh, i.e. without the commandment and promise of God, while Isaac was born according to the promise. So Ishmael and Isaac, they look the same, as in they're both half-siblings, they're both sons of Abraham, but they're uh, radically different in substance. Ishmael was a child born of the flesh, and Isaac was a child born of the promise of God. So these ideas, this allegory that Paul is presenting here, is, is meaning that the law, if one is under the covenant of the law, so that you obey the words of Moses and you make a diligent effort to keep the commandments, uh, but you become conceited. You view your fellow man with contempt. You believe that you're justified before God because of what you do by your own actions. You think you're owed some type of righteousness. And you believe that you can bend the, the divine arm of God by what you do to him. You believe that he is to your bidding. And this type of person actually fiends a love of God. So they can actually fool themselves. So someone who's, who's under this, uh, this covenant of the law, they can feign this love for God and they can fool themselves. But secretly, they really hate God. They hate God because they'd rather break the commandments that they have to keep them. This type of person always finds himself hiding his sin from others. He can't confess to himself. He can't confess to others what he is. So when he sins, he actually sins more grotesquely than anyone else. Grace is entirely different. Grace allows for a man to be free from the domain of sin, not by diligent commandment keeping, but by faith. By faith and the trust that Jesus has done something for him, that God loves him through Christ. So when he sins, when this person sins, they may sin in a big way, but what they do is different than someone under the covenant of the law. They confess, and they say, they almost take it lightly. They say, what else could I expect? I'm a sinner. I'm just a man. But even if his sin is big, so is his repentance. That's the difference between the covenant of grace. He has confidence, not in himself, but in the words of Christ, that he will forgive him. And actually, Charlotte Elliott, she wrote this in her favorite, uh, famous hymn, Just As I Am. This last stanza says, Just as I am, you will receive will welcome, pardon, cleanse, relieve, because you promise, I believe. Not because you did anything, but because God has promised something. So this person believes in the promise of Christ to forgive, and by that promise, he's free. So if, as we go further on in the text, we see Sarah do something here. She won't even refer to Hagar or Ishmael by their names. She calls Hagar the slave woman and Ishmael the son. And so they have to go. Uh, they're, they're kicked out. Now we're going to read their trial. So Genesis chapter 21, verses 15 through 21. When the water in the skin was gone, she put the child under one of the bushes. Then she went and sat down opposite him a good way off about the distance of a bow shot. For she said, let me not look on the death of the child. Now she sat opposite him. She lifted up her voice and wept. And God heard the voice of the boy and the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, what troubles you, Hagar? Fear not, for God has heard the voice of the boy where he is. Up, lift up the boy and hold him fast with your hand, for I will make him into a great nation. Then God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. And she went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. And God was with the boy, and he grew up. He lived in the wilderness and became an expert with the bow. He lived in the wilderness of Paran, and his mother took a wife for him in the land of Egypt. So a few things I just want to note that are, are more about the language here. Uh, and this actually goes back to verse 14 as well. But Ishmael is about 16 at the time where this is happening. So some people can read this, and it seems like Abraham is actually putting Ishmael on the shoulders of Hagar, and that's not how the text really reads this. He's you know, 16. Child is a, a, it's the, about the only thing we can use for an English, but the Hebrew term actually extends to almost adolescence or someone who's not quite an adult yet. And so we see here 
they're in the wilderness. And this is going to parallel exactly with what's happening with Abraham and Isaac. We see Ishmael on the brink of death. We see Isaac on the brink of death. We see Ishmael with his mother, one parent. We see Isaac with one parent, his father. And Ishmael's name means God hears. And where Isaac will be delivered, it can actually be translated as God sees. And we see two things else with the parents. Hagar is lifting up her voice. Uh, Abraham is acting. And we see that with Hagar, her eyes were blinded to the well. And that God had to open her eyes to the well. And we see with Abraham, the angel to point out the ram in the thicket. So these two stories go well with each other. So when we picture this wilderness, we don't need to picture the wilderness of North America or Europe. This is in the, in the Near East, which means it's a desert. It's very arid. And in Ishmael's fragility, he's placed under one of the bushes by his mother Hagar, the length of a bow shot, which is a foreshadowing of his future profession. So why did she do this? Well, she did not want to look upon the death of her child. And this is going to get into the main point that we're going to dive into with the story of Abraham and Isaac. She can see nothing but the empirical data in front of her to suggest that she, and more importantly to her, her son, will perish in this desert. What I mean by empirical data is the fact that we see with our senses, we experience things with our senses, and that gives us knowledge about our world. So if I am touching a table, I feel the table, I, I say that there is a table here. So there's things that we see, and that helps us to understand the world that we belong to. So Sarah is understanding her world. I'm sorry, Hagar is understanding this world, and she is going to die. The water's out. She understands what that means. So she cries out to heaven. But there's something interesting in the text as well, because it doesn't say that the angel talks about Hagar's cry. It talks about Ishmael. Ishmael cried out. God heard Ishmael's cry. So again, it's a play on his name. God hears. And he heard the, the voice of the boy, and a better translation for boy here is lad, which is more of an affectionate term. So Sarah calls Hagar just the, the boy, uh, the son. And we see God calls him affectionately a lad, the same word he uses with Isaac. And God speaks tenderly to Hagar through the angel. So God comforts her. He reminds her of two things. He says, fear not. He didn't tell her that the day of her departure, he waited until she was about to die to tell her to fear not. So one thing to know is that God comes to us in our greatest distress to remind us to trust God is a God of comfort. And he specifically heard Ishmael. It seems that Ishmael is placing his faith in the God of Abraham. God hears. That's the second point. God hears. So God hears all those who cry out to him in faith. And this is very helpful to us because Hagar, remember back in Genesis 16, she had a very similar experience to what's happening now where she runs away from Sarah because she's, she sinned, where she looked at Sarah contemptuously. She runs away and an angel stops her and says to go back. And she, she notices that God sees her and hears her and, and finds that uh, just breathtaking. So if Sarah can sin by looking contemptuously on, I'm sorry, Hagar sins by looking contemptuously on Sarah, and then Ishmael is mocking Isaac, then we can trust that God hears any of us who plead to him in faith and humility. So the next thing we see, Hagar is told to hold fast to, to Ishmael, that he will be blessed. He opens up her eyes, he sees the well, and then they're restored. So for the sake of time, we're going to skip over actually the Treaty of the Bimelech, because we're going to get into the main portion, which is about the sacrifice of Isaac. So, chapter 22, verses 1 through 18, I'll read this. After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here am I. He said, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah, and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. And he cut the wood for the burnt offering and rose and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. Then Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac his son. 
And he took in his hand the fire and the knife. And uh, another word for this would actually be cleaver here. So they went, both of them, together. And Isaac said to his father Abraham, My father, he said, Here am I, my son. He said, Behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they went together, uh, sorry, so they went, both of them, together. When they came to the place of which God had told him, Abraham built the altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. He said, here am I. He said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to, to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing you've not withheld your son, your only son from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide, also the Lord sees, as it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. And the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you, and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven, and as the sand that is on the seashore. And your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies, and in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice. So we come to this climactic end uh, of this passage. And it's an odd, odd thing that we're going to focus on, but it's one of the most important stories that we see in the Old Testament. And so I'm going to do something that's maybe a bit odd, but I'm going to present difficulties to you in order to understand this passage a little bit better before we bring a resolution. And one of the difficulties actually is from Soren Kierkegaard, and he wrote in his book Fear and Trembling. It's it's entirely about this subject. He wrote this dialectic analysis of the story, which kind of means you show contrary positions on it. And he says that we're unable to truly understand Abraham that Abraham is so beyond our understanding, we can only hardly conjure up what it means to be in his position. So at this point in the text, we come to a really odd spot. Because if Abraham and Sarah simply had Isaac and lived out the rest of their days in happiness, we can understand the story. It seems to be a comedy. Comedy in the traditional sense meaning just a happy ending. There had finally been joy in the house of Abraham. Sarah laughed in her old age from the pleasure of motherhood. We could say, this is, a, this is it. This is the miracle. The story could have ended there. It would have been fine. Abraham, Sarah, and Isaac could have lived happily ever after, rejoicing over the miracle that the Messiah would come through the line of Abraham, through Isaac. Nonetheless, miraculous in Zechariah and Sarah with John the Baptist. But we see in the first two verses of Genesis 22 the appearance of a tragedy happening. We switch from the comedy to a tragedy. And again, I'm going to do something odd. I'm going to present more difficulties. So we see here on the first first clue we have, after these things, God tested Abraham. So we understand that this is a test. God is not going to actually require Isaac. But we we can look at this from a New New Testament perspective when we actually need to go back and look at it through the eyes of Abraham. So here's a difficulty. And it's one that um, Kierkegaard at least hinted to, but uh, I will push forth. We can say it's just a test. We know the end of the story, so there's no harm done. But take it as this analogy. Imagine you're a parent of a child. The small child begs you for a puppy, and you promise the child this puppy, and obviously you kind of see where this is going now. But you make him wait for the puppy. You don't tell him when he's going to get this puppy. You eventually give the child the puppy. At a certain date and time, you allow the child to bond with this puppy, have a relationship with the puppy, love it, Care for it. Cherish it. And then comes a point where you tell the child to take the puppy and slit its throat. Now, you can stay the hand of the child right before that fatal blow, but how many of you would think that if I did this to my own child that you'd call me psychotic? You'd think that I'm insane, that I'm a wretch. And I'd say, well, it's just a test. I want to see how obedient he is. Well, you'd say, "That's, that's sick. And so we can... This is a way of presenting the problem of Abraham so that we can finally have a resolution. And that's not to say this is what what God's doing here, but I want to at least see the oppositions to the story. And so what 
could we say about this problem? Of God's test to Abraham. There are certain points that we see in Scripture where God tests people by a seeming concealment of his character and a temporary time. We see this actually with Jesus, with the Canaanite woman back in, or forward in Matthew chapter 15, verses 21 through 28. It's a very odd story. So a Canaanite woman comes up to Jesus, and she's begging him for the deliverance of his daughter from demonic possession or oppression, something of the sort. Jesus does several things that can cause us as readers to feel apprehensive. First thing he does, he ignores the woman completely. He doesn't give her any attention. He ignores her. Next, the disciples come up and beg him to get rid of her. And then again, she comes up and continues to plead with him, saying, Son of David, heal my daughter. And he says, you know, it's not right. First, he doesn't talk to her. Again, he speaks to the disciples. And he says, uh, you know, I, I'm concerned with the house of Israel, the children of Israel. And she again implores him and pleads with him. And he says, it's not right to uh, give to dogs what's for the children. And he essentially implies that she's a dog. And I know some scholars try to use the etymology and say, well, he meant little dogs. There's no way in context in the ancient Near East that any form of dog was an enduring thing to say to someone. But eventually, she keeps pleading. And he's, it's a radical change. He says, blessed are you. O great of faith, you woman of great faith. Blessed are you. Your daughter is healed. What happened? Why did Jesus do that? That's the question. There's a concealment of everything we know about Jesus. He's loving. He cared for Gentiles. We see that all the time. But he's doing it to press in the faith, their person's faith. You see the empirical evidence in front of you that says, this isn't happening. Jesus isn't answering you. Jesus isn't talking to you. He's implying that you're a dog in this situation. But you know that's not what he's really about. He's looking for your faith. Looking for the faith and trust that he is good and that he loves you. And that's what's happening with Abraham. Verse 2 brings about this tragedy further. Abraham does this. God says this to Abraham. Take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. And the English translation doesn't do this justice uh, as well as uh, the, the, the Hebrew actually presents. Robert Alter says that a better way to translate this text is saying that God says, Take, pray your son, your only one, whom you love, Isaac. The idea is that you go from the general to the specific. And the tradition of this in, in Jewish literature is your son. Abraham could say, I have two sons. Your only son. Well, this is the only son of Hagar. This is the only son of Sarah, whom you love. You know, Abraham didn't play favorites. He loved Ishmael. He says, I love both my sons. And then the final nail on the head, Isaac. That's it. So Kierkegaard actually said it's difficult to understand Abraham in verse 2, and it makes it very clear, is that there's no further dialogue between God and Abraham after this command, not until the very end. So this makes Abraham beyond every single individual on earth. There are four things that Abraham didn't do here. He didn't plead against God's command. He didn't, if this was a test, would the test not be how much he loved Isaac? Couldn't he say, I will give up everything that I own, just keep Isaac? He didn't offer himself up in place of Isaac either. If Abraham went and he took the knife, plunged it into his own chest, and said, this is the sacrifice I'll make, we could understand Abraham. We could understand him greatly. We'd say he's a hero beyond measure. But he would be a hero that we would never know that he would not be the righteous father of faith. Third thing Abraham didn't do, he didn't consult with God about God's unchanging character. You see, he didn't do what he did for Lot. You know, God made it very clear what he's going to do in, with Sodom. Abraham did nothing with, with, that he did with Lot. Abraham pleads. He's like, if they're righteous here, you won't destroy them. But he doesn't do that with Isaac, his only son, the son of promise. Fourth thing Abraham didn't do, he did not view this as a demonic temptation. And this is a point that, uh, uh, that Kierkegaard kind of makes as well. It says that we can take these, and this is something tragic in our own environment, where we take the stories of these, these characters, of these people in the Bible, especially in the Old Testament, and we view them almost as legends. We don't view them as real people just because there's this gap of time. And we can almost view them as fictitious. Even though we would never utter that with our lips, we can view them fictitiously. 
Uh, but Kierkegaard made the point that we need to view this as, as something that could happen right now in our own day and age. But Abraham didn't view it as a demonic temptation. If someone did that today, we would say that you're crazy. You're not consulting with God. You're consulting with Satan. But Abraham didn't do any of these things. He acted. That's why we cannot understand Abraham. He didn't go by a sense of reason. He didn't go by the evidence in front of him, but he walked by a sense of faith, believing that God would not truly require Isaac of him. Hebrews eleven nineteen it states this. He considered that God was able to even raise him from the dead, from which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. Why would he think this? He had God tell him to go and offer Isaac. All the empirical data says that, no, this is not going to happen. But he believed not because of his reason, but because of his faith. That's a temptation we all have. And, and I know the objection will be that, well, he had reason based upon the earlier promise that God made, but you're missing the point. What I'm saying is that we live in a world filled with this paradox where we see things that don't correlate to the love and promise of God, but we are challenged to go by faith. Kierkegaard writes this in Fear and Trembling. He, Abraham, left one thing behind and took one thing with him. He left his earthly understanding behind and took faith with him. Otherwise, he would not have wandered forth, but would have thought this unreasonable. So, Abraham is a bit caught in a paradox, and it's a paradox that Martin Luther understood very well. Uh, Martin Luther, the Protestant reformer, had this term called Anfechtungen. The German word can be translated in several different ways, but one way is challenges. Trials, tri temptations, afflictions, or tribulations. And his biographer uh, actually describes it in this way. It says, it, Anfechtung, may be a trial sent by God to test man, or an assault by the devil to destroy man. It is all the doubt, turmoil, pain, tremor, panic, despair, desolation, desperation which invade the spirit of man. So this sense of torment of this constant paradox to Luther uh, happened because he had this belief in the gospel message that victory was won, God is good. But the realities of the world around him would always fight against that. And Paul Bueller explains this paradox. He says, through the gospel, the Christian has come to learn of a gracious God in Christ Jesus. However, his experiences present to him a God who is still wrathful and who, will not, or who not only refuses to forgive sins, but reminds him of them. The hard, concrete experience of life contradict what he had learned by faith. God on his side through the Infectingen is drawing the Christian close to him, and throughout the Infectingen always intends that they should be beneficial to the Christian. So this runs deep in the, the trial of Abraham. Luther witnessed God putting him through trials that seemed to contradict what he would learned about God's love. So it's this idea of dread and despair over the paradoxes of life, the sense of anxiety over how you relate to God. And I, to, to describe this further, I'll actually point out a story of Luther. So Martin Luther, if you may have heard his conversion, but he was on a road one day and, and he was traveling. There was a thunderstorm. Lightning was striking all around him. He was terrified for his life. He thought he would die. So he prays out to St. Anne, who's the patron saint of minors. Minors the profession, not you know, someone under 18. And he prays to her and says that if God would deliver him, he'll give his life over to study of scripture and go into the monastic orders. And so he's delivered. The storm subsides. He, he goes into the order of the Astinian monks. However, his father, Hans, was very furious at this. He did not like the idea of Martin going into the monastery. So Hans was a minor. This was a newly emergent middle class profession. And he goes... And he's, his intent is that he's getting out of the peasant class and that Luther can go on, and Martin Luther can go on into a higher profession and provide for his mother and father in their old age. And Martin goes into the monastery, which means he takes a vow of poverty and of celibacy. So eventually they meet again, and, and neither one really wants to bring up the subject of Luther in the monastery, but Martin Luther eventually does. And he asked his father, why are you so contrary to him going to the monastery? And Hans was pretty furious, and he actually rebuked Luther in front of all the doctors and everyone in there, the, the fellow monks. He says, you learned scholar, have you never read in the Bible that you should honor your father and your mother? And here have you left me and your dear mother to look after ourselves in our old age. And Martin, obviously is a very intelligent guy, he goes back and he points out that Christ says that if you're not willing to leave father and mother, wife and child for the gospel's sake, then you're not worthy of Christ. 
And he thinks that that's, that's it. But Hans actually retorts back and rebukes Martin. Hans told him this, God grant it was not an apparition of the devil. And that idea struck Martin Luther profoundly because he realized that Satan can come as the appearance of an angel of light. He can make a sinister action seem godly. He can make a godly action seem sinister. So this is when Luther first felt this sense of despair, this infectum. Two actions can outwardly appear the same, but one can be holy, one can be demonic. So I have two paintings now. And um, one of them is the, the painting of Abraham and Isaac. And it depicts Abraham with the knife going up to Isaac's throat. And, and a cherub grabs the hand of Abraham and stays his hand and points at the ram in the thicket. And another painting I have is called Ivan the Terrible and His Son, Ivan. And this painting is similar. It depicts the, the rumored murder, uh, or manslaughter, rather, of Ivan the Terrible with his, his son, his, one of his eldest sons. And in this painting, what happened was that Ivan struck his son with this rod on the temple in a fit of rage. He was known to have these fits of anger and outburst. And he struck him on the temple and blood's gushing everywhere. And in this painting, we see Ivan holding the head of his son, cradling him with his eyes wide, and he's realizing what he has done. The blood's running down his hand, his son's whispering in his ear, this forgiveness, and blood's just going everywhere. And they're cradled on the floor together. And you, you can really sense this, this feeling in, Isaac, or in, in Ivan. Both of these pictures depict filicide, the slaughtering of a, a parent slaughtering their child. And the thing that's very interesting is that with Ivan and, and his son, we see this as a spontaneous act. But with Abraham, it's premeditated. With Ivan, we can almost understand what he did. With Abraham, we can't even imagine it. With Ivan, it's nearly forgivable. We can understand the, the, the rage and regret that you have. With Abraham, it's unforgivable. However, Ivan is unrighteous. Abraham was righteous. The difficulties of paradox are here. Normal syllogism for people who kind of fight against the goodness of God, they say three things. God is all good. God is omnipotent. God is omniscient. If those, things, those three things are true, then evil and suffering shouldn't exist in this world. But evil and suffering exist, and so God cannot have all these attributes. Now we can def debate those uh, definitions there, but it's a problem that a lot of people have. And it's one that we can see philosophers and theologians d debate against. But it's something that it's better to not treat it abstractly, but to feel it. If uh, you were in the institutes, you may remember this story because it's been scarred on my mind. There's a story in Alvin Plantinga's Warranted Christian Belief, this book, where he's talking about the problem of evil. And he gives this real story. It's a quote, and I won't read the quote, but I'll summarize it for you. During the Bosnian War, a young Muslim woman had been captured by the soldiers and was brutally raped and tormented by her, her captors in front of her father and husband with her screaming infant next to her. After the tormentors were finished, uh, she begged them for her child so that she might nurse the child. They decapitate the child and throw the head to her. So to so understand the problem of evil exists for people. But the point is, never doubt the goodness of God. God stayed Abraham's hand. He never got to touch Isaac. But God plunged his wrath upon his own son. God poured out his wrath. God joins us in suffering. God joins us in suffering and feels suffering more than we ever do. Because he loves us because he loves you. God did not withhold the greater Isaac, the true sacrificial lamb, Jesus, because he loves you. Faith and trust are to be in him alone. Trust in that. Let's pray. Holy Father, thank you so much for your goodness to us, your grace to us. Uh, we are undeserving of your grace. We are undeserving of your mercy, your kindness, your forgiveness. Please change our hearts. Bring us into an understanding of your gospel and of faith. And even when we see evil in the world around us, redeem us. Make us like you.
It's in Christ's name that I pray. Amen.